Welcome back to another episode of Video City TV. Today's special guest is brought to you by Money Lib Hobson. Today I have Taymula Abdur Rahman with me. Thank you so much for being on the hey, show. Hey, welcome. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So tell us a little bit about who you are. Well, um, I'm a guy who has kind of a unique story. I started out um, as a member of a group called The Perfect Gentleman in 1989. Mm -hmm. um, we had a big song called Ooh La La. Um, we toured the world. Um, we're on the cover of Golden Graham Serial, Oprah Winfrey. I left the group in 92, 93. Mm -hmm. um, went on to be a ghostwriter for Dr. Dre for a little while. Got in a little bit of trouble. Yeah. Um, and then converted to Islam and became an imam, which is like a Muslim leader. Um, got involved at Harvard University, prison, chaplaincy. Became an imam in prison. And um, now I'm, I'm, I'm what you call like an abolitionist. Yeah. You know, yeah. Wow. So you have a whole background, a whole story that we're going to talk about. So we're going to get deep into it. So let's start off from the beginning when you were a rising pop star. With all of that exposure into the music industry at such a young age, yeah. how do you feel that affected your mindset and how you were? Yeah, the great question. Um, it really, it wasn't good. It wasn't good for me. I mean, I really don't recommend that young people get in the music industry because, you know, there was access to so many things that I had. I didn't have emotional uh, time to process emotionally, mm -hmm. whether it was money, women, vices like drinking and drugs. All of that stuff was exposed to us since we were, you know, 13 years old. So yeah. um, my mindset was like, I don't know if you saw Lord of the Flies. It's a movie, Lord of the Flies. Some people may know it from the audience. It's a, it's a, it's a movie in the early 80s about a group of kids stranded on an island, and they just run amok. That's how we were, just running amok. Wow. It's crazy. Yeah, so I know you went through all of these things, and now you're an imam Muslim. Yep. What made you convert? Yeah, I mean, I had reached my kind of wit's end after you know, almost 10 years on the streets, you know, um, getting into legal trouble, you know, running with the wrong people, so to speak. And I knew that in my heart, that's not what my mom had taught me. That's not who I was. I was searching for an identity because I didn't have any mentors. Mm -hmm. So um, one of my friends, he had done something wrong, went to prison, and in prison, he became Muslim. And he oh, used wow. to call me. He used to call me all the time and talk about Islam. And my tour manager was Muslim. Um, so when my friend started to call me, I said, man, I need some help. I need to do something with my life. And so it just felt right at the time. I had a newborn son at the time. Mm -hmm. he, was about, he was about four, actually, but he was new to me. So, um, yeah, I made, I made a transition and just decided it's time to change my life. I was 24. Yeah. And now you have your master's as well for interreligious dialogue. Yeah. And your mentors were Jewish and Christian. So does your curiosity yeah. go beyond being Muslim or do you mm. have other beliefs as well? Great question. Um, I'll tell you what, I started as a religious bigot and I'm going to tell you why. Mm -hmm. um, I studied Islam overseas, but when I came back, I had taken all the trauma that I had from being running around in the neighborhood and I just converted it into Islam. So I was just hateful of other groups and other beliefs because I thought that's how you had to be. Yeah. And then meeting so many uh, religious mentors, deacons and rabbis and priests, mm. it really opened my mind up to the idea that I can listen and learn and that doesn't diminish my own belief system, mm -hmm. right? It doesn't diminish what I believe. Mm -hmm. So I would say now um, that I believe that there's space for everyone to have a worldview and that it's my job to make space and hold and hold everyone's place in a sacred way so that they'll be able to express their story and their narrative. And we all have those truths. You know, everyone's truth is based on their lived experience. Yeah. So I've come to respect that. Wow, that's beautiful. Thank you. So since learning all of this, what are some of the similarities and differences? Yeah, I mean, the similarities, I think, is that um, the belief in one God, right? And I think there's something called, a, a Christian friend of mine calls apocalyptic theology. If the world were overrun by zombies, what would be important, right? It wouldn't be names and labels, right? I'm Muslim, over, I'm over here, you're Christian over there, you're Jewish over there. None of that would matter. What would matter is unity, belief in God, smart people, strong people. Mm -hmm. And for me, that apocalyptic theology is what matters to me today, right? Yeah. So I think that if we can look at the books, the Quran or the Bible, you see universal pr principles of brotherhood, right? Be kind to the neighbor, feed the poor, 
speak justice, um, don't abandon the orphan. These are the universal principles, but human beings have a tendency to get caught up in the minutia, the details, and that's where you find bigotry, prejudice, and difference. Mm. So I think it's, um, it's important that we focus on lumping everyone together on those things that matter, mm -hmm. that apocalyptic theology, those things that really are the core of our belief system. Wow. And you've taken this study of yours and brought it to universities as well mm -hmm. as prisons. Yep. So those are two very, very different spaces and environments. Right. Can you tell us your experience within each? Callie, I'll tell you, it's funny you say that. Um, <laughs> there's no difference between Harvard University and prison in terms of the, client, the clientele. Wow. People have the same problems, Callie. You know, everyone is insecure. Everyone is uncertain. Everyone is full of depression and anxiety wherever you go. Mm. It just manifests itself different based on the access to choices that people have. People in prison don't really have choices to the breadbasket of goods in America. Healthcare, adequate, uh, ed um, equity in education and housing. So it causes them to make extreme choices, right, yeah. that land them in prison. Mm. But Harvard University, those students have the same issues, but they have access to, you know, education and more stable households. So they make different choices. However, in the end, when they sit with me and we're chest to chest, the same tears they cry the same worries about the future and the same anxiety. And what it did for me was it humanized the stories of both groups, right? Wow. Made them both human. Yeah, well, what is, um, what is that like? What, what are the kind of deep conversations that yeah. you have with them? And is it one-on-one -on -one or is it a group setting when you do your talks? Yeah, yeah, so that's, uh, that's really interesting. Um, I've learned that, you know, we can get a certain amount of done, a work done in workshop style, right? Because okay. there's a lot of strategic vulnerability I have to show in order to allow them to be vulnerable. I have to give them license to buy into being vulnerable, right? In both settings, because people at Harvard are paranoid that they're not as smart enough, right? They're mm. not good enough. Why should I be here? Mm. And people in prison are saying, I'm not worthy to be human, I need to be here, right? I'm not worthy to participate in the world. So for me, it's starting the workshops together and then getting them one-on-one -on -one and then really getting them to open up. Mm. Yeah. Wow. How do you feel like those experiences with them has transformed you? Yeah. You know what? Um, I think for me, Callie, it's allowed me to, again, make ex excuses for people because I think what's important in this day and age is that we facilitate civil discourse dialogue across, across political lines, across religious lines, really opening up that door and learning that listening is not diminishing. If you have a political point of view and it's different than mine, I can listen to you and learn. And I need to find a way that it makes sense to you. Like, why does this person feel this way? Mm -hmm. And I think what it did for me is just really open up my ears and my heart to the experiences of other people. Wow. Wow, yeah. this, is, this is deep. So you have a book coming out, American Imam. Yes. Right here, February 27th. Yep. What made you decide to write a book? Mm, yeah. And how long did it take you, right. by the way? Well, I'll tell you what. This book took me um, to actually write. Mm. Believe it or not, it took me about four months. Four months. <laughs> Wow. And that's because, I mean, I had so many ideas that were like bursting at the seams. And I thought it was important because I think uh, Muslim religious leaders from overseas, I think oftentimes that they, the, some of the rulings for Islam are imported for there when they're not appropriate here, right? Mm -hmm. So I wanted to give a social context and a situated knowledge based on my experience as a Muslim leader in America, breathing mm -hmm. in the air of democracy. Mm -hmm. And it's an entirely different experience, for, for instance, if I was a sheikh or a mufti or a mullah from the Middle East, the experience is completely different. And I don't think that Americans really understand what it's like to be an American-born Muslim leader. So I really wanted to, like, share that with them. Yeah. Wow. So in your book, let's open it up a little bit, see how many chapters you have. Okay. 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 What chapter did you enjoy writing the most? <laughs> well, I have, I have, that's a great question. Um, no one's ever asked me that question about the book. I think the first chapter is really good because it's about how, hip, how Islam became hip-hop's religion. Mm. So it's really about my experience with, with hip-hop in the early 80s, right? Being um, 
listening to Big Daddy Kane say "Assalamu alaikum," and Rock, uh, Eric B and Rakim say "All praises due to Allah." Right? That was my first exposure to Islam. And even though Christians in my neighborhood, they were actually taking care of the young kids in the neighborhood. Islam had the better branding because they had hip hop, wow. and we felt like, man, this hasn't there hasn't been a uh, what does that mean? We're good. Okay. There hasn't been a movement like this since the civil rights movement. And we felt like, man, God is finally looking at black people. And black people, you know, love rap. And God loves rap. And God loves hip-hop. And he loves for us to dress fly. Mm -hmm. So that chapter was really fun because it brought me back to my childhood being 10. Oh. And really just discovering, yeah. you know, music and artistry. So that was really good. Yeah. The beginning. Yeah. The beginning of it all. Exactly. So we want to share with them your book launch event. Yeah. February 27th. So can you give us some information about it? Okay, yeah. So actually the book launch launches February 25th um, in Boston. But the, the 27th is when it, it's available. You can pre-order now. 27th, it'll be all over in stores. Physically, it'll be available all over. And um, the audio will also be available too. So you can download it on any of those audio platforms and just take a listen. Yeah. What kind of people should be reading your book? Oh, man. It's funny. I'm, I'm a person that has deep relations with all kinds of people, mm -hmm. right? Um, now they call, it, they call it code switching. But really, like, I can go and sit with my man Stoney SOS um, and kick it with him. Or I can sit with a rabbi and kick it with him. So I really think anyone who is curious about what, it, what it's like to be a Muslim in America, but also people who are curious about... Um, what religion will look like in the next 20 years or so. That's so that means everybody. Wow, yeah, that means me too. <laughs> awesome. I'm about to read this book tonight. Awesome. awesome. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Allah. Thank you for interviewing yeah, me. Yeah, thank you so much for being on Video City TV. You're welcome. Before we end the show, is there any special shout outs you'd like to give? Um, I want to shout out Money Lynn for, you know, being the stand up woman she is. And also my man Doug at Video City. Appreciate you, legend. It's all good. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you, Kelly. Video City, tap in and make sure you guys get this book, American Imam. Hey, y'all. It's your girl, Luna B. And we're back with Video City TV. And we have a legend here today in the studio. Please, let's all put our hands together. Let's talk about Graham's Uncut. Da, da, da. <laughs> all about you tell me all about how much movement you've had in the streets like I keep hearing about all your stuff that you have going on start with what you have going on right now what what is your oh. big moves right now what are you doing right now I mean you know I got the leather I got the leathers man self-made leathers self-made leathers is taking over New York Fashion Week 2024 we did a lot of shows including the Video City show so y'all look out for that self-made leathers and you know the Dippin' Donuts is it's, it's, it's still moving. You know, we're still moving with the Dippin' Donuts, man. We ain't yeah, going to start with that. that's what you know I'm saying? I done, I, done par <laughs> I, I done partnered up. I know y'all remember Hungry Pac-Man. I partnered up with Hungry Pac-Man. And we're taking over the streets, man. That's, Look at this. This is amazing. You know amazing. what I'm saying? We Dippin' Donuts, man. So you know cool. what I mean? Video uh, City. See, this is what I'm talking about. I like it when a man comes in and he brings exactly what we need, which is some nice smoke. We need some good energy. Yeah. Oh, oh, we got that. We got that Villiard, yes. too. Yes, okay. We got that Villiard. Shout out to Rick Ross, the biggest boss. You know I what like man? that. This we got that Villion. You know what? You know what's cool about this? What's cool about the Villion? It's not hard liquor. It's like the liqueur because it got the the cognac, but it's kind of infused with like um, cinnamon and, and wow. vanilla and stuff like that. So it's smooth. Yeah, so, so it's real smooth. All you gotta do is chill it. That's I like it. You, know that. I mean? you gotta See? chase it or nothing. That's exactly what I like because yeah, I feel yeah. like sometimes from Hennessy it gets a little bit too strong, but I think I like Hennessy that if gets it's a little too smoother. Strong. Yeah. yeah, it's real smooth. It doesn't. It doesn't hit the, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. It hit that brown, just ba bang. You know what I'm it's <laughs> kind of cool. like a jab, not an not a uppercut. I like that. Okay, mm. so tell me now, when I'm sipping this, when I'm smoking this, I want to be listening to your new single that you got coming oh, out. Oh, yeah, yeah, the yeah. The song, That Vibe. Tell me about this. Tell me about this new single. Um, you know, well, since I've been into the fashion, I stopped doing the hard, you know, like the hard street music. And got the, it. And the crazy. I kind of started doing more runway music. I like to call right, it runway music. Because okay. it's kind of music you can strut to. You know what I'm saying? I it's like not that. hard. It's not crazy. Crazy, good music. It's kind of like an EDM house music type oh, feel, with a little bit of hip hop. So it's just like a, you know, because when I'm on the runway, man, nobody wants to be rowdy and throwing bowls and smoking <laughs> blunts and you know what I'm saying. Everybody <laughs> want to be strutting. You know, you want the ladies to be strutting nice and showing off the fashion. So I, I kind of branched off into that with that vibe. I like that. That's that so vibe, nice. You know See, I mean? and I'm never opposed to strutting. Y'all know I like to strut. Yeah. <laughs> 
That's amazing. Now, I know you're a legend in here. You've been interviewed by almost everyone in Video City TV. Facts. You've been coming here for years. You are our, our star, our amazing gem of Video <laughs> City TV. So I need to hear about how you got started in this. Like, what made you decide to start being where you're at now? Like, what, what made you start? Well, I was just born in the Bronx in the middle of hip hop. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So, oh, that's so deep. it's just like it's not even it's not even business for me. It's more like a lifestyle. Like mm. I sell my lifestyle. Like I drink, I smoke, I hang out with women, I do music. You know, I I always dress fly. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Everything that I do is is like the five elements of hip hop. Always. You know what I'm saying? So I kind of just found a way to just sell my lifestyle and make it lucrative and just keep reinventing myself you know I like what i'm saying that. oh my god now this dip in donuts I, I gotta show this again before we we talk about anything else now this is amazing so you teamed up with hungry pac-man for this yeah hungry pac-man that's my guy man he's like the cartel yeah you know what i'm saying so we always got the best the best you know what i'm saying <laughs> the best from the west you so know can what we mean? find this in any local shops or how can yeah we yeah we it? actually yeah. have a dispensary in harlem it's dope house dispensary okay. so we got a dispensary in harlem they carry the um Dippin' Donuts and the Hungry Pac-Man. Nice. And uh, we just branch it off. We usually do pop-ups, you know what I'm saying? Okay. And then we have the clothing line that goes along with Dippin' Donuts. Nice. So we usually do pop-ups and uh, give T-shirts, you know, sell T-shirts and get free weed. I like that. Okay, you know T-shirts and sell, free weed. Sell T-shirts. Well, I mean, any, <laughs> any item at our pop-ups, like even in my Picasso hat, like this is Dippin' Donuts Picasso hat. I love that. Anytime I sell one of my products, I always like to include some kind of marijuana product with it, you know what I'm saying? Nice. So you can go home and smoke. Nice. Or, or go home and eat it, you know, edibles, infused <laughs> drinks and all that, so. I love that. Yeah, yeah, I've been, I've been heavy in the weed industry before it was legal, so, I mean, it's just, founders, it's natural to founders. me. Founders, Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I've been that. heavy in it. Yeah, <laughs> so that's amazing. Now, I love just these, these cartoons in this, so this is something that drew my attention to this, is how cool this stuff is. <laughs> so, y'all heard it first, you can find this in Harlem. Y'all know I live in Harlem, so y'all know I'm about to have to go get me a couple joints or two. Oh, know yeah, like we got a nice future joint. together, we got a future okay. together. Okay! Like a pre-roll should be in my uh, my future, please. Yep. Facts. <laughs> Amazing, y'all. So where can we find you online? Where can we find your tags? Where are you? Where can we find you? Um, Grams Uncut. G-R-A-M-Z-U-N-K-U-T. Self-made leathers is S-M underscore leathers. Dippin' Donuts is D-I-P-P-I-N-D-O-E-N-U-T-Z. Amazing. Amazing. And y'all heard it here first. We're here with Video City TV legend. Signing off, Hello. your girl Luna B, Jim Zunkut. Oh, yeah, that new video, that vibe. Check that vibe video. We just had the big billboard on Times Square. We doing it crazy out here, man. Let's Every hear promotion. It. Every promotion. Yes, let's hear the video, y'all. Let's go. That vibe. <laughs>
on my way Ain't nothing you say can block my plate Ladies love me, that's what they say Cool, calm, a little edgy though Self-made like the leftist boo yippee ki yay yeah, it's fine that A Private party, just do your thing Hands up and let's blow the way Beats front like a getaway Poppin' bubbly like it's New Year's Day Dippin' donuts always for 20 Spend the way cause I make more money Having fun, I just don't make money Woke the bank, my kids born with money Out of bounds, I just make more money Gets brought to you by Rosa. So shout out to Rosa. Shout out Rosa. Shout out Rosa. How y'all doing? What's up? Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you for being here. Yes, yes. TJ Brown, tell us a little bit about who you are. You are very young, first, yes. let's say, and you do more than what we think. So can you share a little bit? I am an inspiring artist coming out of Harlem, New York, and I'm also an actor. You can probably catch me on the Get Down, Star is Boo Boo, Roxanne Roxanne, Biopic is Nas, and many more. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Okay, so you have been rapping for a very long time. Yes. Since you were young. You actually got on the trains at yes. a very young age and convinced people that you're a superstar to mm -hmm. a point where someone reached out to you and you got connected with an agency. Yes. Yes. Um, Tell us about that. So first and foremost, shout out Rory Bergman, because if it wasn't for her, then that opportunity would have been presented. But I was about 14 years old. It was me, my dad, and my brother. And we used to go on the train fresh after school. We wouldn't get off until like 11 o'clock. And I was performing. Like, you had the street performers, the dancers, but I was like the first kid to actually... Hold up, 11 o'clock. You got off of school at 3 o'clock, and you finished performing by 11? Yes. How many days a week did you used to do that? Monday through Friday. Monday through Friday. That's like a whole shift. Bro. Like Actually, if I'm correct, no. Mon we would go full-fledged. <laughs> we Seven would, days a week. Yeah. We, yeah. Probably not no Sunday, but we went. We, it was the work that had no break. Yeah. So we was, out, we was outside. Yeah. How and was that like for you as a kid? Um, it was bittersweet. You know, the experience and all that was really fun and all. But, you know, as a 14-year-old kid, you still got life, you know. Coming out of school, you want to do some things, go mm -hmm. have fun with friends. But my dad always told me it's a bigger level to having fun, you know. So I just stuck with that and just, Nelly, I'm here with you. Yeah. You know? Yeah. 
So how do you think that experience, um, being on the train, performing, and really exposing yourself to be able to work on your talents? Because mm -hmm. that takes time to be able to, you know, present yourself in front of a crowd and perform. Right. And, you know, you're 22 now. So this mm -hmm. was, like, years ago. Yeah. What was that like? Like It was an experience. Practice? I feel like it was an experience that still sits with me within this day because I also remember where I came from. Mm -hmm. And I remembered how to work a crowd. Mm -hmm being on the New York City subway, you know, so. At such a young age. Yeah. So how do you work a crowd at such a young age? Trying just, to get everyone's attention. It's just interaction and it's just that connection. You got to let them know that you're here with them and you just like them. You just trying to have fun, get mm -hmm. their attention, you know. Because, you know, NYC crowd is, is a hard crowd to get, especially <laughs> yeah, on the subway. like. Yeah. <laughs> so if I could get people from the NYC subway to interact with me, I could get the whole world to interact. Yeah. That's just what it is, you know. Yeah. So you've been on the show, The Get Down. Yes. What was that whole experience like for you? It was amazing. Yeah. It was definitely what a What was the funnest experience. thing? Filming with everybody and just meeting yeah. everybody. No, the opportunities. Yeah. The opportunities was amazing. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. So did you get to work with um, Jaden, Jaden yes. Smith? Did yes. you? So you guys interacted and everything. How was he in behind the scenes? But, but he's a great person. We actually built a relationship. Like, you know... Working on sets is actually like co-work or just strictly work. But no, I actually built a relationship outside of work. And it's really dope. That's amazing. It's really dope, yeah. 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 Okay, so when it comes to your music, what went first, your acting or the music? The music was first. The music was the first. The acting is what got me in the door and the limelight. But I started doing music first. And it just go hand in hand. So now I just continue kept doing it. Yeah. Know? Yeah. How is your um, process like? Do you uh, find a concept first and then you write, or you listen to a beat and then you flow with it, depending mm -hmm. on how it makes you feel? I listen to a beat first. You listen to a beat first. Yes, I feel like beats, like, it speaks to me. So, mm -hmm. like, it depends on the sample, the sound, the way the snare kicks. It tells me what I want to write about or what I feel. Mm -hmm. And I just go full fledged. Or it's like something I probably could have went through. Like, something that just put me in a dark space or put me in a happy space, and I'll just go write about it. And, and yeah. it's, it's, it's a process, but I love it, you know? Yeah. I love it, and I love the, the artistry of how I do things. It's really dope. How far do you want to go when it comes to your music? So far to the point you can't bring me back. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so far. It's, yeah. like, it's no limit. Sky's the limit. I just want to just wanna yeah. change the people's lives around me, change my life, and just actually show them what music is about and bring back substance, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Would you say it's hard work or easy work being in this kind of industry? I say both. <laughs> I say well, both. How, what is hard about it and what is easy about it? It's hard to stand out. Mm. It's hard to stand out. Like, everybody's either doing the same thing or on the same wave. It's really hard to stand out. But the easy thing is finding your own lane. Yeah. Yeah. Because there is no one like you out there. So it's like if you know, like if you're confident within yourself and your work, you know what you can bring to a label or to a show. But like other than that, it's hard. Yeah, but that's what I say. It's Before hard. you perform, mm -hmm. do you give yourself a pep talk? How do you prepare? It's me and my team. We always be backstage, and they always like, it's go time. Let's go. We're gonna do it. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, yep. I still get that butterfly feeling, but that's just like. I reassure myself, like, I know I'm about to do good, you know. If I don't get no butterflies, then yeah. something's going to happen. Right <laughs>